with intricate relief work and a roof of green and red tiles. Why would these nomadic basically herdsmen, why would they need a palace structure at all? Well, this was a city for storing all the riches that the Mongols had accumulated, but it wasn't so much material riches. The Mongol Khans, when they got material riches, they just gave them away. The main riches were the artisans and the experts, all the people from the various countries that they brought into their entourage. Many of them were Chinese, they were Persian, there was Europeans, Russians, all kinds of people in the empire that were working for the Mongol princes. But they couldn't live on the steppe. They just weren't adapted to that. Tringis himself, when he visited the city, would live outside the walls in Agur. As his empire grew, he proved to be more than just a brilliant warrior. He was an innovative administrator and statesman. And what Chinggis Khan did was he joined east to west, took these various civilizations of the Middle East and forced them to learn from each other. And there's this free exchange of ideas and techniques, and the Chinese are talking to the Persians, and the Persians are talking to the Europeans. Right. You know, Copernicus, the star charts he worked from were star charts made under the patronage of the Mongols, because the Mongols, they didn't want to hear about how Middle Eastern astronomy was the best or Chinese astronomy was the best. What they wanted was the best of everything. So they told the Chinese and the Middle Eastern astronomers, get together, make the best charts you can. So this was, in many ways, a melting pot of all the cultures across the empire. Exactly. It was a melting pot in the middle of the steppe. Genghis Khan created his empire through death and destruction then went on to radically alter world culture. He brought about the first contact between Europe and China and encouraged a dramatic increase in trade throughout the empire. He guaranteed the safety of camel trains. He invented the first Pony Express. He pioneered the idea of diplomatic immunity and he outlawed torture. Some barbarian, huh? So what happened to Shingis Khan? Chris tells me that when he died, he was buried secretly in an unmarked location. Some Mongolian chronicles tell the stories. They just say he died. They don't say anything about where he's buried. But there are travelers' tales that say Shingis Khan was buried, and those who buried him were killed. And then those who killed them were also killed. And they would trample horses over the spot so that it would look like as if nothing had been there in order to keep it absolutely secret. As for Kharkhorum, it existed for only about 50 years. After Shingis Khan's death in 1227 AD, the empire began to fracture into smaller Khanates. In 1274, his grandson, Kublai Khan, moved the capital south to China and created the city of Beijing. Kharkhorum, the city in the steppe, had no function and wasted away. They say that history is written by the winners, but in this case, history was written by the victims. To the Persians, the Chinese, and the Europeans, the hordes were demonic murderers. And that's how they're often remembered today. But not in Mongolia. Exactly 800 years after Shingis Khan unified the steppe tribes, the Mongols' brief stint as empire is a source of pride. I've discovered that the so-called barbarians of 13th century Mongolia, though brutal in warfare, ruled their empire with a surprisingly tolerant bent. 800 years later, Mongolia is a quiet country. But the impact that Chinggis Khan had on all of Eurasia is incalculable. It's not surprising Mongolians are proud of their history. And nowhere is that more evident than here in the capital, where everyone has come together to celebrate and acknowledge the 800th anniversary of the Mongolian state, founded by Chinggis Khan. This is the annual Natam Festival, where every year Mongolians display two of the skills that brought them glory master horsemanship, and archery. Their conquest led to a complete change of life for the Mongol people. Almost overnight, they went from being backward nomads 
mocked and ridiculed by their more civilized neighbors, to being masters of their universe. Chinggis Khan put Mongolia on the map. And today, Mongolians revere him as a visionary founding father. The spirit of Chinggis Khan is alive and well in the hearts of Mongols today. But genetic scientists are now discovering that his legacy may also be found in their blood. I have come to the Mongolian Academy of Sciences to meet some genetic researchers who are tracking down the genes of Shingas Khan. Dr. Dashniam Bumbang's team sampled the DNA of three million Asian so this men. Is where it all happens. You, you took a sample from across, from, from across Asia. Yes, we studied only Y chromosome. Y chromosome, uh, which is, uh, let's say, sign of men, right? Okay, so you, all the samples were men. Men, and I know that the Y chromosome does not change. Right, from yes, father yes, to son, yes. typically. Uh, Y-chromosomes, they transfer from father to son, mm -hmm. directly, mm -hmm. without any change. The Y-chromosome determines a person's sex. Where women have two X-chromosomes, men have an X and a Y-chromosome. Since a son has exactly the same Y-chromosome as his father, geneticists can isolate this chromosome and track it across generations of male relatives. And that's basically all it takes to get a Y chromosome sample. That little swab is then put into a vial, and that vial is sent off to the lab, where they remove the DNA from the cotton and create a Y chromosome sequence. From this data, Dr. Dushniam discovered that in Mongolia, one branch of the family tree is huge. The same Y chromosome turned up again and again. He's calculated that it's the Y chromosome of a man who lived sometime in the 13th century. Somebody was very busy, yes. right? Yes. <laughs> Had a lot of kids. Yes. Our genetic data and calculations show that was Genghis Khan. But how do you know that this is Genghis's DNA? We don't know. We don't have a body. Uh, yes. It could be someone else living at the same time. How do you know that? This is uh, two things. One is genetic study, and second is historical data. We can read in historical books in very detail who was Genghis Khan, how many sons, grandsons, wives he has. So these historical data really confirm our genetic data. So as he's conquering the yes, empire, yes. he's sort of starting another one. Genghis and his sons after him each had hundreds of concubines and had made it a mission to spread their seed throughout the lands they conquered. A combination of the massive death toll of the initial campaigns and this one family's breeding strategy appears to have borne fruit. And so now, 800 years later, the Natam Festival, drawing visitors from all over Mongolia, is more than a commemorative event. It's a huge family reunion. Looking around, how many of the people I see could be Chinggis Khan's relative? It makes me wonder. Some of our crew is from this part of the world. Could one of them be a descendant of the great leader? Everyone on the crew contributed some DNA to find out, including myself. Here are my results. Each of these pairs of numbers stands for a variation of a gene. In the first two pairs, Chinggis and I match. 16. But not for the rest. 13. Okay, okay yeah. No. And no. Too many differences across the pattern. I admit, it wasn't very likely. But here are the results for all the members of the crew including our local fixers here, the people who help us handle the logistics in this country. So let's line them up. One of the fixers is a match. And the winner is... Baggy! Hey. Isn't that great? Good. Yeah, come here, I'll show you. I'm happy. Almost every single number is a match. Baggy. Thank you. Baggy Khan. It just goes to show that Chinggis Khan's progeny are everywhere in this country, something Mongolians point to with pride. 
a lot of people can share Baggy's royal ancestry. Dr. Dustium has calculated that across the lands they conquered, 8% of the population is descended from Shingis Khan. Worldwide, that's about 1 in 200 people. The estimated size of his current family is over 32 million. That makes him the most successful patriarch in recorded history. He was a military genius unlike any the world has ever known, and his blood continues to flow through millions of people. His empire is ancient history. But the legacy of Chinggis Khan lives on in the genetic fabric of our world.